on the uh, table in front of you is a card that has a sticker on the front, an adventure sticker, and then it says, Welcome Home. If you'll complete that and turn that in at that big metal table down there, we have some gifts we want to send home with you. And there's some stuff in the worship folder you're going to want to look at. We have classes coming here in just a few days, a couple of weeks. Classes will start. So make sure you're doing that and getting signed up for that. We really strongly encourage you to be involved in these small group events that are going on. It's just, that's where you meet people. That's where, you, that's where you're able to feel like you belong. And it's also where your best growth is going to be. Um, next Saturday morning, we have a human trafficking conference going on here. All right. And I uh, really want to encourage you, there's information in the worship folder. Take that to work, get that posted wherever you are, let people know this thing is out there. Um, we have uh, from 11 o'clock, 11 a.m. to 12.30 is for parents and kids 6th grade through 12th grade. Then from 2 to 4 is a the same conference but with more detail and a little more wisdom about some of it. And that's going to be a little more graphic as well. And that's going to run from 2 to 4. That's for 18 years old and up. But this is one of those things in the country. We need everybody in on this. So come and get trained so you can spot some of this and, and learn what's going on. All right? So there you go. There's some stuff there. So today we're going to talk about, and we're kind of following up on what Travis taught last weekend. We're going to talk about following Christ what does it mean and how do we do it when times get rough because there are times that get hard and we're not very good at following him and you remember in the story of job it says that in all of this job did not sin nor did he blame god all right so we want to have that kind of character so no matter what comes and if we're actually following christ and growing we'll be able to withstand whatever life throws at us so that's what we're going to talk about today all right we're going to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to lift our voices together. Father, thank you so much for loving us, and thanks for the opportunity for all of us to be here. And God, we ask today that you just teach us, teach us from your word, teach us from your spirit today, Father. Help us as we grow to be more and more like Christ, as we reflect his traits into the world today. May we be a light in the darkness, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, I'm going to invite you to stand and let's lift our voices to the Lord together.
you've done for me.
stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. Stop.
Thank you. You may be seated. So apparently I posted some kayak pictures this weekend and confused everybody. Um, I am not on the river, as you can see. Though if I could find a way to be two places at once, I would. Um, I was a safety paddler for Floatzilla yesterday. And uh, let me just, I got to do this public service announcement for you. Because I spoke to about 900 kayakers as they passed me yesterday. <laughs> Before you buy a boat, you need to... <laughs> one, decide what you're going to use the boat for and find one that matches your body mass. You know what I'm saying? Are you with me? Do I have to be? I saw a lot of boats that I thought were submarines or paddle boards. Um, boats are made for moving water or they're made for still water. Still water boats should not be on moving water, especially if there's beer involved or a long trip. Um, Friday night, I retrieved five lost boats from people and uh, who lost their boats. So I'm trying not, I'm trying not, yeah, are they for sale? Uh, I wouldn't give very much for these boats, so, or the paddlers, but uh, anyhow, but uh, so Travis and I are going to leave after church next week and we're going to try to knock out about 641 miles over 12 or 13 days. So we got to be really moving. So pray for us for good weather. And then Greg Schaus is coming to get us. We're so excited. All right. Greg's one of our camp buddies, and we miss him. So this will be fun because he's going to get to smell us at our absolute worst, <laughs> which makes it even more fun. All right. So we're talking about how do I follow Christ in hard times? Listen, if you are not following Christ going into the hard time, it's going to be really hard to follow him in the hard time. All right, that makes sense? If you haven't practiced it beforehand, it's real hard to execute in process. And I'll tell you right now, there is no question that we are living in some really crazy times. The practical inflation rate is 17.2%. 49% of U.S. households are on some form of government assistance. One presidential candidate won't talk to anyone, and the other won't shut up. <laughs> right? We have politicians who are becoming millionaires, and we know they don't make that kind of money from us. There are wars. There are rumors of wars. There are threats of wars. Derecho is the new favorite word of Midwest meteorologists, right? We keep seeing it over and over again. And I'll tell you, it reminds me a lot of what Jesus was talking about in Luke 21. Watch this. Luke 21, beginning in verse 26. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Let's stop there for a second. You following this stuff on this star named Beetlejuice? Not the movie, Okay. There's a star out there 600 million miles away. They've been tracking. They're saying over the next few days, it's going to go into a supernova that will be so bright, we will be able to see it during daytime. It'll be a star in the daytime sky. And it's going to happen over the next few days, beginning back in 2019. <laughs> All right? So eventually it's coming. Or you see people freaking out about the poles on the sun are going to flip. The sun's going to, I heard somebody say, the sun's going to turn upside down. Do you realize that happens every 11 years? So I've already survived 11 of those. Lisa Ashby, God only knows how many of those <laughs> she's survived. But you, if you're more than 11 years old, you've survived one and you didn't even know it happened, right? Or now they're saying, well, the earth's magnetic poles are going to turn. They're going to flip. That's happened lots of times since God created a thing. So Jesus says this. He says, listen, 
This is what's going to be happening. People are going to be terrified. They're going to look around nature. They're going to see the world around them. They're going to see the signs and the wonders that God has built into nature and already planned. And they will be terrified. Now watch, a couple verses later, verse 28. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift your heads because your redemption is drawing near. I love the calendar that God has built into nature. He says, listen, when the world is going into chaos around you, because you are mine, you can stand, you can lift your head up, and you can say, my God is an awesome God. He's in control. He's got this. I love that. Let me take you back in time a little bit. Let's go back to right after uh, the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001. Do you remember the TV series 24 with Jack Bauer? So, Steph and I didn't watch the first two seasons. We didn't start watching until 2003. And at our house, I'm not allowed to jump into the middle of a series. We have to go back and start at the beginning. So I ran up to Blockbuster, and I rented the first two seasons of 24, because we had to watch that before we could catch up with what everybody else was watching. And so we lay down on the floor one night at about 8 p.m. to watch the first episode where Jack Bowers called out of retirement because there's this black senator named David Palmer who's running for president, and someone's made a death threat against him, all right? So we lay down there, and we watched this thing, and at the end of the first episode, the tension was so high, we decided to watch the next episode. <laughs> and at the end of that one, ah, one more episode. We can do this. So we decided to watch one more episode. Seven episodes later, <laughs> at 4 a.m. in the morning... By the way, 9 a.m. Jack Bauer time. <laughs> we forced ourselves to go to bed. So the next night after some meetings, we got started again. <laughs> 11 episodes later. <laughs> we're in episode 21 of season one. 8, 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. Jack Bauer time, just so you know. Jack was taken prisoner by this terrorist named Victor Drazen. And we were so tired, we couldn't finish it. And so I go to bed now. I, I love storytelling. I love, I love people's stories. I, for several years, I've been a fluency reader for several authors, which I can't tell you. They're, I got non-disclosure agreements with all of them, but I read chapters of their books to help them get through stuff. And oh, it's a great hobby. I love it. Um, and so I love stories. So I'm going to bed now, not even the end of the episode. And all I can think of as I'm crawling into bed is, What's going to happen to Jack? I mean, how are they going to resolve this? How's he going to get through this? Is he going to escape? And I laid there thinking, and then it dawned on me. Everybody else is in season three. <laughs> and I just read that day, Jack had signed for like three more. Kiefer Sutherland had signed for like three more seasons of 24. So, yeah, Jack's going to be fine, right? Now, there's going to be some ups, there's going to be some downs, there's going to be some character changes, going to be some that are going to exit, some are going to be added, but yeah, go to bed. <laughs> He's going to be fine, right? Listen, this is the picture that Jesus gives his followers. He said, yeah, listen to me. Yeah, things are going to happen. Things are going to change. There's going to be some ups in your life, there's going to be some downs in your life. There are going to be some... Old characters are going to exit. Some new characters are going to be added. But yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I've already written season three. <laughs> and guess what? We win. We're going to be together again in eternity. Now watch this from Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. 
And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are what? Gone forever. Now, so we get into Philippians 4. This is a chapter so many people are very familiar with and so few people actually live well. <laughs> so I'm going to work from these verses. I'm going to read them from some different translations as we go through them. Then I want to look at how each of these verses is actually a command to prepare you to follow Christ in hard times. Now, when we talk about following Jesus, to follow Jesus means that after salvation... I'm going to systematically and progressively rearrange everything about my life toward becoming more like Jesus. Listen, if you are, I'm just going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do air quotes, and I hate air quotes, but I'm going to do them. If you are saved and you are not intentionally changing your life to be more like Christ, the air quotes are legit <laughs> because saved people grow to be like Christ. Now, how do we measure whether or not I'm growing to be like Christ? I'm going to give you two questions that are really going to matter. These are not in your notes. You can write them in a blank spot there somewhere. All right, but here's the first question. You've got to ask yourself, what percentage of my life does God want? What percentage of my life does God want? All right, so... No longer a rhetorical question. How about an answer? What percentage of my life does God want? 100%. So God demands, God saved me because he wants 100% of my life. So there's your first question. Again, how much of your life does God want? 100%. Next question. What percent of my life does God have? That hurts. What percentage of my life does God have? That's the question you've got to be asking yourself constantly. What percentage of my life does God have? Now, I want to give you four basic commands out of Philippians that will help prepare your life so that you can, without embarrassness, embarrassment or shame, answer honestly this question, what percentage of my life does God have? All right, so here we go. Number one. I am commanded to take responsibility for my attitude. Philippians 4.4. 4, always be what? Joyful. Then in the, yeah, in the Lord. I repeat, this is how important it is. Be joyful. So joy is an attitude, and all of our attitudes are choices. So I look at this passage, and I understand this is a command from God. I am to take responsibility for being in control of my attitude. No one can make me have an attitude I do not choose, ever. So when God gives us a command, we're to take that seriously, right? So God says, your attitude, your responsibility. Now, Steph and I learned early on that it was just as important, maybe more important, to discipline our kids for attitude as it was for behaviors because behaviors flow from attitude. You teach them to control their attitude, they will control their behavior. We, I remember giving this speech many times to my kids. If you can't control yourself from the inside... I have to control you from the outside. So what we're doing is we're teaching them responsibility. We're teaching them to take, take responsibility for themselves. See, discipline is about making good choices. 
And there is just as much choice involved in choosing my attitude for the day as there is in choosing my behaviors for that day. So God commands us to take responsibility for our attitude. By the way, you say, I, I just can't. It just happens to me. Listen, God never commands us to do something we are not capable of or that he will not give us, through the Holy Spirit, the ability to do. So if God gives us a command, he expects us to take responsibility. So he says, what I want you to do is I want you to take responsibility for thinking about the right things. I want you to begin to focus on being a joyful person. Now, the way the, way the Holy Spirit works in your life, he's going to help you with all this. But here's how Jesus says the Holy Spirit works in your life. John chapter 14. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will, circle this word, remind. He will remind you of everything I have told you. Now that feels like a bit of a conundrum for us. So how do we hear what Jesus wants us to do? Through his word. Listen, you say, I keep asking God for the guiding of the Holy Spirit. I keep asking God, what does he want me to do? Listen, if I haven't been actively learning what scripture says, if I haven't been putting scripture inside of me, there's nothing for the Holy Spirit to remind me of. I'm literally cutting off his ability to, to help me out. He cannot remind me of something I haven't heard Jesus say. So I've got to be in Scripture. All right, now number two. I am commanded to keep my head. You ever watch somebody just freak out? Just lose it? And it, does, it could be something insignificant. Like for me, like just hitting my head on anything. <laughs> I mean, that just ticks me off instantly like that, right? He says you got to keep your head. You have to keep your head. Here's why. Philippians 4 verse 5. Let your good sense be obvious to who? Everybody. Why? The Lord is where? Near. So he says this is how I want you to be known. I want you to be known for your good sense. It just feels like a Bob Newhart statement, doesn't it? Remember that scene where he yells, stop it! <laughs> this is what Jesus is saying at this point through, through Paul. I want you to be known for your good sense. So when things happen, things don't phase you like they phase other people and when you keep your head, you don't dishonor me. Listen, one of the best ways to keep your head is to work very simply at a basic level, work very simply from what we call God's book of wisdom, which is the book of Proverbs. It's in the Old Testament, all right? I love the book of Proverbs. Um, you say, well, I, you know, I can't find things that are in my Bible. Okay, if you've got an Old Testament and a New Testament together, got the whole Bible, if you take that beast and you split it right down the middle here, you're going to come up in the book of Psalms somewhere. All right, Psalm 119, the biggest chapter in the Bible. Okay, what you're going to do, split your Bible in half and then just go one book to the right, Proverbs. Make sense? That easy? All right, so the book of Proverbs is this amazing book this got all these little pithy one cent. Well, basically, it's almost a book of memes. Some of you are really hooked on memes. You read the book of Proverbs, you're going to love this. It's a whole bunch of memes without the pictures, but that's what it is. It's right there. Now, I'll tell you, the book of Proverbs, there's 31 chapters in it. Just like, you know, on the biggest month we've got, there's 31, 31 days in the month. The longest chapter in the book of Proverbs is chapter 31. It's 498 words. The average person reads between 200 and 250 words per minute. You can literally, literally read the longest chapter in Proverbs in two minutes 
Or if you're a little bit slow, five minutes. You say, oh, I don't know if I have that kind of time. Can I tell you something? We have purchased just the book of Proverbs in this little book. This is the biblical book of Proverbs. There's a bunch of them back there. Greg's holding up a bunch of them. They're on the table. Please feel free to pick up one of these on your way out today. And here's what I want you to do with it. I want you to take it home, and I want you to put it in the bathroom. <laughs> if you are healthy, at least once a day, you're going to be in there for two to five minutes. Multitask. All right? Don't let Instagram destroy your body image. Get into the book of Proverbs. Quit, quit doom scrolling right on your phone. Just set your phone down, pick up the book of Proverbs, and read a chapter. Well, I don't know what, what, what chapter I should, write, should I read. Okay. And get your speech thing fixed. Um, here's how you do it. Whatever day of the month is, you just read that chapter. Today's the 18th, so today you'd read chapter 18. Yeah, you do that. All right, you just read through it. Do you realize that one year from now, you will have read the book of Proverbs through 12 times? You pick up even a little bit of that wisdom, and your friends are going to start calling you Yoda. All right? I mean, you are, it's going to benefit you. Now, why do we strongly encourage that? Because reading the Bible, even just one book, the book of Proverbs, the mean book of the Bible will give the Holy Spirit something to remind you of. And believe me, everything is covered in the book of Proverbs. All right, number three. I'm commanded to practice my calm. So if you're a sci-fi, if you're a sci-fi fan, back in 1993, there was a book, or a book, there was a sci-fi movie uh, called Demolition Man. Tell me you remember it. And you remember the big funny phrase that came out of it? They're trying to talk people into using their minds and choosing their peace and all that kind of stuff. Sandra Bullock had a character that she played in that. And the big phrase from that character was, enhance your calm. Listen, that's what this command is. You've got to practice your calm. Being calm is a choice. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Watch this. Don't worry about anything. God says, choose to not worry about anything. Instead, pray about what? Everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he's done. So don't, don't worry about anything. It's a command. I'm just curious. Is there anybody in here who is worried about something? Yeah. I mean, for real, right? But understand... God wouldn't command it if it wasn't possible. So this is what he says he wants of his children. He says, your level of worry reflects your level of belief in who I am. It reflects your level of belief in how much I love you. Bad things are going to happen in this world. They are. But talk to me about them. Let me show you there's more to life than just what you see or experience. Lift up your head, rejoice always, and your faith in me will lift up the people around you. Now, here's the result. Okay, so he says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Now, watch this. Four, uh, Philippians 4 verse 7 then circle the word then let me just remind you real quick we've talked about this before a lot of scripture is based on an if this then this scenario if you do this God will do this if you do this this is what will happen all right so we've talked about this before if you choose not to worry which is what he's telling us to do in verse 6 here's the result then Verse 7, you will experience God's peace, which, by the way, exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds. Now, 
circle the word as. As you live in Christ Jesus. Listen, if you're not choosing to live your life intentionally, trying to implement more and more of the life of Jesus into your life, this doesn't count for you. If this, then this. If, if you don't worry, if you focus on being like Christ, you'll have that peace. But if you don't, you won't have that peace. See, God's peace that exceeds everything we can even comprehend protects our hearts and minds as we live in Christ Jesus, growing in Christ Jesus. I mean, what happens with stress, well, we get stressed out because we don't have control, right? But for the one who trusts the one who's in control, there's going to be this increasing level of peace. But only in Christ Jesus. Only as I am actively seeking to implement more and more of the life of Jesus into my life. Number four. I am commanded to maintain my focus. So there is what I think is a hilarious story. It's in two of the Gospels. And um, I mean, I've referenced it a, a couple times over the last few weeks uh, and I'm not going to lie, I chuckle at this. I have actually stood and looked out on the water where this took place. And come go to Israel with me here over the next, you know, when the war's over. Um, and we'll go stand in that spot. And you can actually look out on the water where this story happened because it's, it's just not a big place. Um, so I chuckle at this story, but I 100% understand this story. I get it. I would have been one of these guys. Matthew chapter 14. Immediately after this, so they've just had this big interaction with this massive crowd, which, by the way, is on the same hillside where Jesus did the Sermon on the Mount where he fed the 5,000, all right? Now watch this. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, dun, 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 watch this. The disciples were in trouble, far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. Hey, been there, done that, don't recommend it. All right, that's my one-star recommendation. About 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, Walking on the water. Now, I've never seen Jesus walking on the water. A couple times I thought I might meet him out there, though. <laughs> Verse 20, well, let's see what it, where we at. Verse 26. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. <laughs> now, this, this cracks me up. This, this absolutely cracks me up. So... <laughs> It, one, it sounds a lot like Admiral Akbar from episode four of Star Wars where he yells, it's a trap, all right? Kind of the same thing going on here. But the ancient Greek mariners actually believed that Charon, who was the ferryman who would paddle dead people across the river Styx, that if you were on the water, you would see him coming to you to fetch you to take you back. They thought they were dead. They knew better than this, but what do they do? Well, they fall back onto the old superstitions they'd live with. So this, it's a ghost, not only is it a dumb statement, it ought to make you and me feel a lot better about ourselves, <laughs> right? Because we've made some dumb statements, right? By this time in their lives, these guys have seen Jesus do all kinds of things. They have seen him miraculously heal hundreds of people. He's healed leprosy in front of them. He's healed people with all kinds of other ailments, from blindness, from mineralogia, to fevers, to physical deformities, to paralysis. They have seen him cast out demons. They have seen him raise people from the dead. And get this, just four chapters earlier, they were out in a boat with a storm. Remember that one? And Jesus is asleep in the boat. And they go back and they grab Jesus. They're so sure they're going to die. And they grab, you know, one of the things I love about it, this boat was so small that it actually says Jesus was asleep on the cushion. 
One cushion in a whole boat, and Jesus is asleep on it. They're sure the boat is going down. They go back, and they're shaking Jesus. And you can see him just shaking him, and they're working their mouths. We're dying, but Jesus can't hear him over the storm. So what's he do? I can see him getting up, looking around, going, peace, be still. Turning around, looking at the disciples. What? <laughs> They've already had this experience with him. And now, what's the most rational, spiritual thing they can say? It's a ghost. Not a great moment of faith. <laughs> they fell right back into their old ways. Now, verse 27. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, for I'm here. Remember, I've already dealt with this once for you guys. Then Peter called him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Like a ghost wouldn't do that for some fun, right? <laughs> Verse 29, yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Here you go. Most exasperated words of Jesus in all scripture. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? What happened? Peter quit looking at Jesus and he took his eyes off of Jesus. He started to fear what was happening around him rather than trusting the one who was above what was happening around him. He lost his focus. So Paul comes back, and Paul's reminding us now. Paul says, keep your focus. And then he tells us what to focus on. Philippians 4, is that 8? Now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is, here, say it with me. What is what? True and, 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 and. And that right there is your filter for what you post on social media. If your social media post doesn't pass that test, hit delete on your account. Don't post it. He says, think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And so just like that storm that surrounded Peter, and distracted Peter. Understand, there is a battle for your attention. There is a battle for your focus. There is a battle for your mind and for your thoughts. I don't know what the battle around you is. I don't know what you're going through. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's the health of a loved one. Maybe it's your marriage or some other relationship that needs healed. Maybe it's something in the life of a loved one. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your schooling. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your business. Maybe it's your future. Maybe it's your fear of world events. Listen, you can dwell on the waves of the storm around you, or you can focus on the one who walks above them telling you, I am here. I mean, this is what God wants of his children. You see, he wants us so full of self-control, so full of grace, so overflowing with joy that the people caught in the storm around us look at us and say, I want your peace. I want your faith. I want your God. See, right now as people look at you, is there, a, is there actually a common sense peace that attracts them toward your faith in God? In the interest of full disclosure, I struggle with this too. I do. I struggle with this too. I wrestle with this. But listen, when that struggle gets hard, I know that I am usually approaching, I'm somewhere on the path, approaching what we all like to call an aha moment. I am. I'm approaching this moment where my spiritual growth is going, aha, I see this now, and I'm going to take a leap forward. 
Now, I'm not going to lie to you. In the interest of full disclosure, I'm not excited about that. One, I don't like change. Two, it usually means that aha moment usually follows a moment of pain. But aha moments are good for us. Peter had an aha moment as he sank into the waves of the storm. Wasn't a fun experience for him. I think he was pretty sure he was going to die. This is not a good thing for a nomadic sheep herding guy from the desert to be sinking in a giant lake of water. But we all have those moments. At least people who are growing have those moments. If you've not had an aha moment, So let me take you back to the original questions. What percentage of my life does God want? 100%. Now ask yourself, honestly, what percentage of my life does God have? Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for an opportunity to come and to really ask some tough questions today and take a look and do some measuring. Father, we are so grateful that you've got our back on this. We thank you for the command to not be anxious. We thank you for the command to live like we're actually following you. Father, thank you for showing us how to think and how to choose what we think. Thank you for calling us your children. Thank you for giving us grace to enjoy and thrive in. Thank you for showing us when we're wrong or we're falling short. Now, Father, help us as we seek to strive to focus on things that are true and honorable and right and lovely and pure and excellent and praiseworthy. Right now, I want to encourage you, as we go into the Lord's Supper in just a moment, thank God that you get to speak to Him directly. Thank God that He loves you. Tell Him how comforting He is. Ask Him for protection as you trust Him and as you grow and develop and as you come into your aha moments. Father, thank you for this time today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to share in the Lord's Supper today. And you don't have to be a member at Adventure. You don't have to have taken a class at Adventure. If you've given your life to Christ, He invites you to share in this time. And you can do that. The cups are on the table in the basket. There's a thin layer you can peel off to have access to the bread that Jesus said would forever represent His body, which was broken for us. There's a thicker tab that gives you access to the juice, which Jesus said would forever remind us that his blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sin. Thank him for that. Talk to him. Ask him to help you find that next aha moment so you can continue to keep growing. And we'll come back. We'll close out together in a few minutes.
Hey, it's been really good to be here with you today. Just a couple things. So we have classes coming up. There's uh, several of them listed in the worship folder, and the sign-up sheets are right back there. And some of those we need you to sign up for because either we have to provide books or you need to let us know that you're getting your own book. So those are coming up in September. Uh, we also have a kind of sm s'more fest coming up uh, on Saturday, the 14th of September, and it'll be out at the lake. And it's bring your own stuff. We'll have a fire come out and make s'mores with a bunch of friends all right so that'll that'll be a good time and all that and uh, i do want to remind you something so we have some people won't normally remind you this we have some people that are going through some medical stuff so before you run up and hug them ask them if it's okay to hug them <laughs> all right some of them have had surgeries some of them are really you know they're they've got a little bit of a challenge immune system right now and they they may be glad to be here and be glad to see you, and we'll high-five you across the room, but don't necessarily need to be up close and personal and getting crushed, because some of y'all are really good huggers, all right? But I can tell you, it hurts sometimes, like right after your October 25th back surgery. So um, anyhow, so be careful. Just ask. Make sure you ask before you go hug at them or whatever, all right? Okay. Hey, thanks for being here. You're dismissed. Please bust your tables. Uh, have a great rest of your uh, weekend.